Welcome to the Cables to Clouds podcast. Cloud adoption is on the rise and many network infrastructure professionals are being asked to adopt a hybrid approach. As individuals who have already started this journey, we would like to empower those professionals with the tools and the knowledge to bridge the gap. Okay, and welcome back to Cables to Clouds. This is Tim. And uh, today we had a great uh, discussion with Pete Lumbus about uh, innovation and the networking space versus some of the other technology spaces. But before we get into that, let's go ahead and do the news. Uh, this week, honestly, uh, the last couple of weeks have been a little bit slow, minus the uh, <laughs> the days of our lives uh, for open AI, which we'll cover here in a minute. But uh, we will, by the time you're hearing this, uh, a, uh, AWS reInvent is happening right now. So I'm sure there's a lot that's already come out. You guys are already hearing. And don't worry, our next episode will be covering a recap of the whole AWS reInvent and what went on and kind of give our takes on it. So stay tuned for that. Uh, now let's, uh, let's get into the, the days of our AI lives here. Um, <laughs> I, 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 I'm sure, you know, most of the listeners probably have, have seen some version of this or some amount of this by this point. But, uh, I gotta say this one came out of nowhere. Uh, so for those who are unfamiliar, Sam, Sam Altman, the CEO of OpenAI, who that's the company that developed, uh, chat D- GPT. An AI company, they, uh, the board, the open AI board just randomly and out of pretty much out of nowhere, uh, dismissed him like within 24 hours. They just kind of said, Hey, you're out. And that kicked off just, wow, just, just such a, <laughs> such a shit show. Um, I, I, before I, before I, I run through it, I think we just have to stop and check in a little bit. Um, you know, Chris, Alex, you guys, I, I know we were talking about this when this first happened. It just came out of nowhere. Um, what did you guys think? What was like your first thought when you first heard this happen? Yeah, it was. I figured there was going to be like, I figured at least by this point, it's like, so it's about, you know, like a week old at this point. I figured by now we would have a little bit more information about why the board wanted to dismiss him. Still very vague. Phil is still very unclear as to why he was dismissed in the first place. Um, I'm sure there's something on the back end, but uh, I think the most interesting thing about this entire ordeal is how much happened in such a short span of time. Uh, like, I feel like if, if we, uh-huh. if we walk through the timeline, this sounds like something that could be in a documentary that took place over, you know, three months, but this was like four days, you know, which is, which is just crazy. <laughs> uh, there's, there's going to be a documentary. I'm sure. I'm sure there'll be a, a Netflix special in the next. Netflix is already years, cutting just... deals, dude. <laughs> You know it. <laughs> right, exactly. Yeah, it was it was crazy, man. Uh the whole weekend. I mean, I was just you know, there was just constant flow of flow of like news and people chiming in with their opinions and trying to get a beat on everything. And uh like Twitter Chris said, was nuts, I'm, man. Oh yeah. Well, like Chris said though, I'm very surprised. Like we still it's a week later and we still don't know what actually happened. Like the board never actually gave a reason other than just some vague wording on the announcement and then like some cryptic cryptic tweets here and there. So, I mean, I saw a lot of rumors flying. There was, there was a lot that came out um, about the, 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 first of all, just why, right. That's still the big question mark. Why did it happen? And then the suddenness of it. And um, there's been, you know, I guess, and I don't know if this, see, uh, this is the problem with the story is that there's so much out there that you don't know what's true and what's, what's not because there's so much of it is close to the chest. But there's a lot of it out there saying, you know, open AI is open AI, right? Like it was, it was made as a, as a nonprofit, like AI development firm. And that, you know, since chat GBT kind of just absolutely exploded in the stratosphere and kind of kicked off the, the gen AI. Um, I don't know what you'd call it at this point, tech boom, whatever, whatever the, the newest, you know, the newest flag to plant. Um, you know, there's a lot of money. Like how, how what, what we did the story just a few weeks ago about how many billions of dollars they were estimating to be in Gen AI. And, um, so yeah, so, so there's some rumors flying around that Sam Altman, Greg Brockman, um, he's the, he was the CEO. I think I have to go look at that. I th- look that up. I Greg think he's was, the CEO. Yeah. He was president of the board. Yeah, that's what it was. Right. 
But yeah, so so you know, Greg left right after Sam was uh, he tendered his resignation resignation as soon as the board fired Sam, and we'll get into that in a second. Um, but there's like I said, a lot of the rumors have to do with Sam and Greg and like a lot of the employees being kind of for profit focused, but the board being the other way around since OpenAI was was founded on the idea of open development and like um, you know ethics, privacy. Like it's it's almost like a classic good versus evil type of corporate scenario if you you know if any of this is to be believed but um all right so yeah so that happened what friday friday afternoon wasn't it that that happened that the firing happened and yeah like yeah it's i mean do you want do you want to like just run through the timeline because this is it's pretty yeah yeah let's just roll through it and then we'll roll back to it (laughs) we'll roll through it and then we'll roll back to discuss it because it's nuts right so yeah um so he he was dismissed what friday afternoon Nobody said why. The board didn't explain why. He he posted a Twitter. Sam Sam Altman posted a Twitter saying like I'm out. Basically, uh, Greg Brockman pretty soon after said the same. Um, I think the very next day, or I don't even know if it waited for the next day. I think it did. Um, you know, he they were already in talks to bring him back. Like the board was already in talks to bring him back. If if memory that serves was Saturday, here, yeah. Which is which is nuts, right? Like how is that? <laughs> I, don't, I don't even know what to well, say about that. Like, what do you say? The board thing, though, that happened because of all the employees. Because they yeah. built the, that letter that had, they only have 770 employees and over 700 of them signed the letter. To was it over oh, 700? Yeah. I, thought, I thought it was over 500. I thought I saw numbers that was over 500. I did. Maybe it, maybe yeah, it I think I think it was like six ninety or something like that, somewhere Jeez. around there. Okay, it was it was so. a large amount. It was it was more than ninety percent of the total organization yeah, had okay. signed this letter, and and that one already has me wondering. Like it makes you wonder about like the whole uh, good versus evil thing there. Like how could it? You know, if every employee supports this guy, like what does that say about the board? Anyway, so there's that, um, and and I was reading this article about it, and. Uh, Anyway, let's finish the let's finish the timeline here because it's still pretty nuts. Uh, so yeah, so that was Saturday. Uh, still on Saturday, was it the next day or was it still Saturday that he basically got the offer from? Was it I, is Microsoft? I think that among was announced others. Monday. That was announced Monday morning or something like early morning. Yeah, I'm trying to I'm trying to actually refer to the timeline now because it's so chaotic that it's like really hard to remember every single piece of of data. But it, the fact that it, it was, happened in this serial fashion and so quickly, Sunday was the day that he went back to OpenAI with the guest badge and posted to Twitter. Is like right. you know, the first time I'm going to wear one That's of right. these, uh, or first day and last time I'm going to wear one of these. And then so that, but then they didn't close on the deal, right? To bring him back. So then they brought in uh, as the interim could, CEO yeah. the uh, the previous CEO of Twitch, uh, Emmett Shear. And then uh, that's right. And then Mike. And then on Monday, Microsoft was announcing that <laughs> that Sam Altman was joining as a, like an AI head of AI researcher or something like that, and Greg Brockman as well. Yep, and and Brockman too. Yeah, and all the all the uh, employees were saying that basically that they were gonna. Drop a you know open AI and move over to Microsoft as well. Um, yeah, it's absolutely nuts, right? So and yeah, I think within the weekend and Monday, open AI had three different CEOs. <laughs> yeah, yeah, because yeah, they they promoted Mira Mira Marati got she was the interim CEO, uh, but then she was the first signature on that letter to uh, have the board resign and bring Sam right. and Greg back, and then. Emmett came in <laughs> and then Emmett got replaced with, with Sam again anyway. Yeah. So all of that basically, uh, you know, he basically said, Hey, or Microsoft said that he, Sam was joining the, was joining Microsoft as their new head of AI you know, development along with Greg Brockman. But apparently the ink wasn't dry on that or something. So, so somebody did some take backs because uh, before that, you know, even actually happened, Sam was back at OpenAI. So here's the thing. Microsoft pledged to invest like four like fourteen billion dollars like in thirteen point nine billion or something. So yeah. it wouldn't surprise me, honestly, if you know, essentially Sam is bought and paid for by Microsoft anyway. Like no matter which company he works at, <laughs> you know what I mean? Like 
Because well, they also own like full, what forty nine percent of the company or something. Yeah, that's what I mean, right? Yeah. So my guess is, that, you know, hey, they were going to bring Sam over, or maybe they never were. Maybe it was always a pressure tactic to get the board to resign. I mean, there's so much. This is what we were talking about, right? Like, there's so much bullshit out there that nobody like. There's too many rumors. There's too many. I, you know, nobody knows why anything a week later, we have no explanations. And, you know, it wouldn't surprise me if, if basically Microsoft was, if it was all a power play by Microsoft to get the board to fall, either fall in line or resign and then put Sam back where he was anyway, because he's probably doing more good over there for Microsoft than, you know, necessarily under the Microsoft umbrella, maybe, you know, there's a lot out there that we don't know yet. The point, I think the point that you made, Tim, earlier is, is probably the most concerning thing is that we, we, while we don't know why he was dismissed initially, the reports say that there was a misalignment between their nonprofit and for profit offerings, right? And Sam leads the, the yeah. obviously the for profit. And while I, say, I would think in the public eye, Sam Altman has straddled the, the ethics line relatively well uh, as far as like, um, you know, advocating for um, ethical use of AI and, and protection of data and privacy and things like that. The fact that the board dismisses it because of a misalignment with that part uh, is a little right, concerning. Right. Um, yeah, it's, I, it's really hard to tell what's going on behind closed doors um, with this one. But yeah, I, I think... I don't, I don't know. I don't know. I don't know if there's any real winners here. It sounds like things may be worse off. And if, if you're looking at from that lens, right, of, of ethics and privacy, it's et cetera, right? Well, the board's charter was the board's charter was at odds with the idea of, of privatization, monetization at the end of the day. Right. So, I mean, could this have all been a power play to essentially change the charter of the board in a way that, you know, kind of a hostile takeover type of way. I don't know. Yeah. Right. Like it's terrifying to think that that could be the case. What, what do you think, Alex? Yeah. I mean, like, like you said, all this is speculation, right. For all around, but I mean, it, it's just the whole situation is so crazy and it did end up that the entire board got replaced. Like none of the original yeah. members are there anymore. They brought in is new it, people to head the new board. Oh, and, that they, right? they brought and back, do they have they the same in, charter? They brought in uh, Larry. Women aren't good at science. Summers as well, so that's really a <laughs> that's the cherry on top. <laughs> so uh, yeah, I'm sure that'll that'll work out well. So yeah, I mean, if you wanted to change the board's charter from nonprofit to for profit in a way that doesn't require the kind of um, I don't know what the word is I'm looking for uh, politics and almost like a homeowners association type of thing where you need like certain number of people and like all sorts of stuff on paper and the legality and and all of that. Right. Like what, what better way to get around all that than, <laughs> you know, if you yeah. were going to do something like that, you can leverage the publicity that you have to do it. I, I think what's weird is, you know, they should have like a, a board that over oversees like the safety and the ethics and the privacy and stuff. Somebody but those should be. are not the same. Like you can't have that board and the board that's trying to run the company. And I think because that was like combined to me, that's, yeah. that's why there were so many clashes. Cause they're just, there's two different missions there. They're completely different. Right. And yeah. Sam's job as CEO, it, it, you could look at it like he was doing his job. Right. I mean, so there's there's so many sides to the argument here. Yeah. Well, Microsoft wasn't investing, you know, fourteen billion dollars for to to protect safety and ethics of everybody. Oh come on, dude! You don't think Microsoft has your back? I'm sure they do in a database somewhere. <laughs> <laughs> um, no, I mean, look, honestly, the more the quicker this freight train begins to roll, you know, it's it is like a freight train, like all technologies, right? You get the first couple wheels rolling, and then before anybody knows the trains left the station and who the hell's driving the train anymore. Right. So it's a little scary, not because I think, you know, Hey, Skynet's going to show up and, and terminators and going to destroy us and shit. But like there, there are a lot of real, real world concerns that are, I think are valid and, and, and a for-profit um, method, if you will, of AI development is a little concerning. So for me personally, um, but anyway, uh, I don't know if you guys have any other closing thoughts on that. Otherwise, we'll let's just, let's talk about the episode for a little bit. I, one last quick thing, because um, I'll people are going to mention the argument that they're a capped for profit company. Um, but I saw a breakdown of this. I think earlier today, maybe that while they're capped for profit, they are making so much money 
that it's like more than any company has ever even made. So it's like the cap doesn't even matter. Right. You know, like you can argue it does, mm-hmm. but, but it, in, it just doesn't really make a difference to say that. Yeah. yeah, yeah. This, we're, we're, the truth is we're not going to know until the Netflix documentary comes out. I mean, to be honest, probably by the time this episode is out, who knows what's happened? Like, you know, the, the, the Big Bird could be CEO at OpenAI. <laughs> this could be old news by the time anyone's hearing it. That's a very good point. Mm. Um, okay, so let's talk about uh, let's talk about the episode with Pete. Um, Pete Lumbus is a really really great guy to talk to. I think I think personally, this is probably going to be one of our most entertaining, interesting, hopefully thought provoking episodes that we've we've done. What do you guys What do you guys think, Alex? What do you think? Yeah, I mean, I've been I've been thinking about this uh, a lot. A lot. I've I've already re-listened to it um, a couple times. Uh, Pete made a bunch of really good points. Um, you know, one of the main things that is is a good chunk of the episode. We talk about um, kind of DPUs solving networking the way that it probably should, uh, as in bringing the edge of the network not to like top of rack, but actually to the compute host. Um, I've just been thinking about this a lot lately. Like there's, there's so much here to, to unpack and uh, kind of compare how, how and why CSPs can do what they do and why uh, enterprises aren't quite there yet. So I think like we mentioned in the episode, um, we definitely will have a part two and might, might even need a part three, depending on uh, how much, how much more Pete has to say, but it, it was a really great episode. Yeah, I think it was, I think it, it was really fun to have someone as well seasoned and um you know, uh, uh, with accolades such as Pete's to uh, come in and talk about this, you know, someone that has a pure networking background who's kind of gone into the compute side of things, you know, working for NVIDIA and um, and now at Upbound, right? Um, so it was it was really, he had some really good points and some <laughs> some fairly hot takes, uh, which is, uh, I think, uh, pretty pretty normal for Pete. So, um, yeah, it, it, it was definitely entertaining. So, yeah, let's uh, let's get into it. Hello, and welcome back to the Cables to Clouds podcast. My name is Alex Perkins, and I am at Bumps in the Wire on socials. Uh, I will be your host for tonight's episode. As always, I'm joined by my two lovely co-hosts, Chris Miles uh, at BGP Maine and Tim McConaughey at Juan Golbez. Uh, Today, we're joined by a special guest that seems to have traveled to every nook and cranny of our industry, and maybe even somewhat recently into a newer one. Um, but we'll get to that. So uh, I'd like to welcome Pete Lumbus at Pete CCDE. How's it going, Pete? Hey, hey thanks for having me, y'all. Thanks, Alex. Uh, doing well. Doing well. Good. All right. Glad to hear it. Um, why don't Why don't we do a quick uh, introduction and kind of rundown of your career, Pete? Um, basically, you know, who are you? What have you done? What are some of the places you've worked? And uh, where do you find yourselves these days? Uh, yeah. So. Uh, I've been in the industry for a couple of years. Um, I started as an intern, actually, if we want to, if we want to dial it way back, uh, at Cisco. But before that, I actually had the worst interview of my life where I failed my interview at Cisco for an internship, sweated through my suit and then ended up doing help desk, uh, as an internship instead of working That's at Cisco. Nice. So for all of you who have ever bombed an interview, there is hope, um, I uh, did a couple internships at Cisco. Um, I went and worked in, for a managed service provider in New York for a hot minute before going back to Cisco in TAC. Uh, did a little work working in TAC on the firewall side. Uh, realized my passion's actually like data networking. Uh, jumped over to the routing team. Uh, worked there for a bunch of years. Became the escalation engineer. So one of the kind of four people globally responsible for the worst, most awful garbage uh, most broken, stressful things, um, which is like to tell people that I used to have hair and then I started doing that. Got a CCIE on the way, uh, kind of accidentally got a CCDE, which is a weird thing to say. Uh, I never really like intended to do the CCDE, but I accidentally passed, like I passed it to research and then they were offering the test like half a mile from the office. And so felt silly to not take it. And then um, I spent a huge chunk of my most recent career at Cumulus Networks. Um, I started as an SE, kind of like post-sales consultant for a named account, um, moved into technical marketing, ended up running 
uh, technical marketing and documentation, um, really helping a lot of like product development and where are we going? What are we building? Who are our customers? How do we talk to them? How do we reach out to them? How do we architect networks? How do we build those networks? How do we manage those networks? All of that stuff. We got acquired by NVIDIA. That is a much more complicated and nuanced story for that you can buy me beers and I will gladly tell you. Um, and then uh, about a year and a half ago, I left to join a company called Upbound. Um, and Upbound uh, does Kubernetes for the cloud. It's a much longer story, but if you're familiar with Terraform, uh, it's m a lot like that, but we just do it all on Kubernetes instead of using some other other third-party DSL or tool. All right, so just a couple things then. All over, all over the place. <laughs> Okay, um, so that that is quite the journey, um, and I'm sure we're, we're going to get into uh, more of this a, as we go along. But we figured with that that journey, right? Uh, you'd be a really good person for this topic. Um, so the theme of today's episode is basically we're going to kind of compare and contrast the pace of innovation uh, between you know like the compute industry versus kind of the compute net computer networking industry, um, and specifically as it relates to cloud networking. Um, it, at least from the outside, I think to most people, it kind of seems like the compute industry moves very fast and the networking industry might not move as fast. Um, so <laughs> we're, we're going to dive into that and we'll, we'll try not to turn this into too much of, of, a a ramp fest as we go. <laughs> I, I, yeah. I will, I will do my best, Alex. It's the, the big challenge here is I not only have a soapbox, <laughs> I have an entire bar soap factory to stand on top of for this conversation. <laughs> yeah. Well, feel free. Uh, let let loose if you need to. <laughs> All right. Um, so let's start it off with, I guess, a little bit of historical perspective. Um, so I, I thought it'd be kind of cool to talk about basically our, the four of us kind of where, what, how we've seen the industries evolve in uh, each area. So, you know, we got everything in compute. We'll, we'll start with compute. We got everything from like you know, starting with mainframes all the way up to like microservices. Um, I guess starting with you, Pete, what, where did you kind of come into the industry? Like what kind of phase were we in? Were we already in like virtual machines? Like where, where did you enter into this, this area? I, I think I got really lucky because I came in when the 6509s ruled the earth, like the Tyrannosaurus Rex of old, um, and I would say like half of customers were virtualized and the other half weren't. The idea of like a routed access layer was like super revolutionary and like sounded great on paper, but nobody was going to do it. There was no such thing as an overlay. There was no network virtualization. NICERA, which became NSX, had been invented. There were still a lot of like software driven pieces of garbage network devices, like your old classic ISR 2600 or 2800s. Uh, I mean, workhorses, but not fancy. And I was at Cisco when they came out with their like CRS line, like the CRS one first came out and that was the big mamma jamma. Um, and so I really feel lucky to have watched a lot of that evolution, both from a networking technology and hardware, but also from a customer implementation and things like that. I, I mean, I can tell you when they came out with the Nexus 3000, which was the first non Cisco chip in a switch. Um, number one, that was huge. Like it was like, I, I can't even begin to tell you the hand wringing that I had witnessed in TAC and TAC isn't even a very important place to witness product development. Right. So for me to see, it means that it was way worse on the inside. Um, but there was this talk about like automation and like, you can run puppet with it. And I was like, I don't know what a puppet is like that sounds made up. Um, so I, I've, I feel very lucky to have kind of watched a lot of that rapid evolution. Okay. Yeah, that makes sense. What about uh, Tim? Where where did you, you know, you might be a little older than some of us. So where where did you start off? <laughs> really? Really, dude? Wow. Yeah, no, I was I was there when we uh, we started by painting on the fucking cave walls. And uh, <laughs> no, I mean, dude. Okay, so my first real tech job was at an ISP, a dial-up ISP. So, but this was even... 
I mean, this was the year 2000, right? So it wasn't, it wasn't that, that long ago. I mean, we were using, uh, 56K modems by that point. And if you want to know what I actually cut my teeth on, that's, that's a whole other discussion, right? But, uh, by the time I was working at an ISP, it, we were using, uh, 56K modems and like, you know, we had, um, DSL and we did a uh, hosting. So it was like a hosted for, so for on the compute side, um, it was all physical still like, you could, it, they were, they were blades, like they're the pizza box blades, right? But it was all, you'd build the blade and install Red Hat on it, put it in the rack, connect it, and bam, now your, uh, your customer can, you know, log into it and deploy their website or e commerce or whatever it is. So it was still very much physical at that time. Um, we also had, uh, like I said, we had a DSLAM and we had some kind of ATM. I don't even remember what it was now. It's been so long. But, uh, I mean, I wasn't even in the knock at that time. I was actually working phone support. And then on the weekends, I was building servers and stuff. So that was, so I guess if that puts some, some idea of, oh, oh, this is good. We, we had, we got the uh, nasty gram from Aaron. So the Ameri- the registry for internet numbers. And they were like going to take all the public IPs back if we didn't, um, justify them. So I had to actually go inside all of our folders for all of our customers and like fill out these forms for Aaron to justify our public IP address allocation. That was lots of fun. And then, you know, we had like fractional T1s and frame relays and stuff like that. So that if that dates me, then I guess I'm I'm dated. Awesome. Well, uh, what, what about you, Chris? Sorry, just can you reframe the question? What exactly are we, <laughs> what are we answering here? Yeah, it's really just like, where you came into the industry, like what kind of phase was compute in, you know, was it still Mm. all physical? Was it VMs already Uh, networking? Was it like three tier topology, you know, like the traditional 6509s, like, like Pete was saying, Um, just kind of where, where did you come into everything? Yeah, I got you. Um, I can say when I came in, which was uh, honestly not, not too long ago, that definitely network, the, the realm of network virtualization was almost non-existent. That was, that was pretty much not a thing. Um, I was working for a MPLS and, uh, unified communications provider. So, um, I remember like we've talked about it on this pod before, but like MPLS and L3 VPN just like blew my mind once I finally got it. But I, I had little to no exposure to the compute side, but I will say it was definitely early VMware days. So, um, there was, a heck of a lot of virtualization already going on in those elements. Um, you know, UCS, things like that. So, um, yeah, that's about where I came in. Okay. Yeah. I think me and you must have probably started right around the same time in the industry. Cause I think mm-hmm. that's, I'm basically right around the same area. Um, I know and NSX, Nicera had already been bought by VMware and become uh, NSX, like Pete was mentioning. Um, I, I still worked with a lot of like three tier networking topologies, right? So it wasn't like um, all the CLO fabrics and everything that we see these days and these large hyperscale data center networks that are just insane to think about like 10 years ago. Uh-huh. Um, so, okay, cool. That, that was just kind of setting the stage for everything. All right, so so let's dive into uh, some of the factors specifically driving compute innovation. Um, and, you know, one of the first things that, that you hear about a lot with compute is Moore's Law. Um, Chris, you want to... Give us a quick summary of, of what that what that means. Sure. As the resident expert and recent Googler of Moore's Law, um, I can say that <laughs> it, it basically boils down to that the um, that the processing speeds of, of computer processors will basically double every two years. So obviously there's um, a rapid uh, rapid increase there almost every interval, right? Yeah. Do, do you guys think, does this seem true in reality? Um, I mean, I know it's seen, I don't know if it's every two years, right? Exactly. But um, it does seem like you see a lot of innovation in the chip space. And I don't know, Pete, I don't know if you're probably like the closest to this space and can speak on it. Um, do, you, do you have any thoughts there? I think if you draw, you know, you draw the linear line, you know, the, their years were below and years were above, but on, on net, um, it's been absolutely true. It's getting harder and harder. Um, the, the main thing is it's becoming a, a, a power and space problem. Um, because it's, I think Moore's laws is about the number of resistors and you can think of a resistor as just a heat generator. Um, and so you're just getting more and more and more heat to the point where, you know, we, we, you can't dissipate the heat with air. Um, 
and we're not at the point where we're really willing to adopt um, liquid cooling. And I think this is actually like NVIDIA's whole play, like beyond GPUs, but like saying like, look, general purpose compute has these limitations and we're about to run into them. Like, let's start doing yeah. specific limitation, like specific compute. Like if, if anybody's old enough to have owned a dedicated sound card, you know, like what's old is new again. Like, you know, there's RFC 1925 rule, whatever. We used to have dedicated sound cards and then processors got fast enough that we could just do all the sound of the processor. That's a stupid idea. Why have a sound card? And that was the same thing with graphics. And now we're back to, you know, I need a high end <laughs> graphics card. And I'm sure in the future we'll, there are these other offload engines um, that will be added because we can build a, a, a chip or a set of chips that do that function more efficiently than a general purpose CPU. You probably don't, you probably, you guys probably don't re remember it, but uh, at the dawn of, of gaming, of computer, of PC gaming, uh, we had a, uh, we had a pass through card, like a graphics, not like a, not like a true, truly dedicated graphics card, but it was called like a 3D accelerator. And so if you like, I remember getting one and using it for Doom 2. It was Doom 2 was the game that I bought that for. And I'm really, I know I'm dating myself now, but yeah, it was exactly what you said, Pete. And what, what's old is new again, right? Is that you'd, it was just a card you'd put in the machine and you literally just, you know, cabled your graphics card to it. And then the other end would go into your monitor, right? And it was just, a, it did exactly what it said. It was an accelerator. It was an offloaded uh, processing card. Well, I never got to experience sound cards, but by, by Pete's theory, all I got to do is watch the clock. Eventually, they're going to come back. So I'll be waiting for the, <laughs> next, the next sound card I'm, interval to come through. I'm, I'm long on Sound Blaster. That's... That's it. Sound Blaster, <laughs> This yeah, is not maybe. an investment podcast, and I'm probably not allowed to give investment advice, but... <laughs> Sound Blaster is the next GameStop. Wait, oh, wait, pre-COVID or post-COVID GameStop? Yes. <laughs> Good stuff. It It is interesting, though. Um, you know, we're talking about all these, like, special purpose cards, but, uh, and you mentioned NVIDIA, you know, you got all these new things, too, like DPUs, right? Didn't DPUs just come out pretty recently? Um, there's all, like, you know, the hype around smart NICs and, like, all these other special purpose oh, yeah. kind of things. Um you know, I don't. So it is. It is interesting that they're being broken out like that too, and into, into all these special purpose purpose cards. Yeah, and I kind of glossed over my time at Nvidia. Um, you know, I started Nvidia doing Ethernet switching stuff. Kind of, you know, cumulus continued, um, but actually moved into be the director of technical marketing for DPUs. Um, and so for the DPU space, to take a step back, um, for some of your listeners, when you have a smart NIC. Um, really what you have is not just like a fancy network card that hands off packet processing, but there's a lot of work that can, it can do around copying data directly into memory. Um, and so without this function, what happens is that you have to notify the CPU that there is a piece of data. The CPU wakes up, takes that piece of data, copies it to memory, and then notifies an application. Hey, application, you have data that you need to deal with. And that extra step can be completely cut out and you can have, they call it zero copy or something like that, um, to have that NIC copy and read directly from memory and bypass that CPU altogether. And so there's like a little tiny baby CPU on this smart neck. And then what they did is they took that and they elevated it. And they're like, let's take that baby CPU and leave it there. Let's have all that same NIC functionality but let's slap a full-blown ARM CPU and memory and storage on top. Let's basically like shove a server inside your server. And now you can deploy this in one of two ways. You can either deploy it in an isolated mode where it, it is literally a server that you can SSH into and you have full administrative control over. And it, you know, it's like a, it's almost like a transparent firewall kind of thing. Like the server person and the network person doesn't know that there's this third party in the middle, yeah. or you can expose that functionality to the CPU and say like, here is a card with extra capabilities. This is what VMware is doing right now is you can offload some of the VMware NSX functionality onto the CPU of that NIC, of that DPU, uh, to get some of those CPU cores back. That's 
kind of the the high level marketing around DPUs and smart NICs. I believe that uh, the CSP has leveraged this too with uh, for for like uh, NSGs and uh, smart you know um, security groups and all of that. It's all based on smart NICs on the actual host that the you know, it, it absolutely is. And I think that the the most clear example is um, Amazon acquired a company called Annapurna a long time ago. And Annapurna's whole thing was like, they were the f- not even the first DPU, they were DPU zero. And I don't even think they had really fully come to market before Amazon went and scooped them up and just shut down their, their yeah. commercial business. They're like, nope, you're ours now. You will not have any customers. We are your customer. And the Annapurna Nick is what drives AWS. This is really interesting. I So I this made me think of a question of, do you think that is more an innovation for the compute space or for the networking space? Um, or is it just kind of like a combination of both? I, I hesitate here because there's there's a couple of answers here. Um, it, the simple answer is it's an innovation for both because really what you're doing is you're providing specialized, uh, you're providing a brand new generalized resource to whoever finds the most value for it. And so... One of the examples that you could theoretically do, I don't, I don't know what the capabilities are today. So take, take what I say with a grain of salt. Um, but I could provide an ability to do storage block checksumming onto that DPU. And so I slap this and a storage appliance and all of a sudden I just got 30% more performance by just installing a cart, right? Like that's huge, especially when I'm talking about like a, say like a Nutanix like device or a, um, you know, hyperconverged yeah. like device where like I'm running VMs and I'm running storage. And so every CPU cycle I get back means more VMs, which means fewer servers, which means more efficiency. So on the abstract, everybody wins. I have extremely strong opinions that the general value of DPUs is to solve networking the way that we've always been trying to solve networking in which the fundamental theorem of network design is smart edge, dumb core. And we have yep. always treated the edge as the top of rack switch. And that is not the edge of the network. That's right. And the reason mm-hmm. why AWS can create VPCs is because the edge of their network is the compute layer. And the core of their network is the top of rack switch. And I think that the DPU fundamentally changes how networks get built in clouds, but we lack the capability to do it today. Like we, we have, we have the parts. We don't have the, we don't have the glue. You mean like, so like not, Ed, are you saying everyone lacks the capability to do this or like, can the CSPs kind of do this, right? Because they have things like you're saying, like they can create VPCs. It's just that this hasn't trickled down or yeah, just the yeah, skill set isn't there. Okay. I, I can't speak universally to the CSPs, but in general, like the CSPs are doing this today, right? They are putting the networking at that bare metal host. And the thing that is even more powerful about this is that you now normalize networking across your infrastructure. And what I mean by that is that if the NIC is my network demarcation, it is the exact same demarcation for Kubernetes, for VMware, for bare metal, for mainframe, like for Windows, for Linux, like it doesn't matter anymore. Yeah, whatever the compute is, that's the whatever edge, the compute basically. is. That is the solution. And so, Alex, back to your question: the CSPs, these cloud service providers, the Azure's, the Microsofts, uh, Azure, the Microsoft, the Azure's, the AWS's, the GCPs of the world, they've absolutely done this because it's the only way it works. What my point is is that you, nothing stops the rest of the world from doing this, except for the fact that it's hard and complicated, right? Like. Why do we buy cars instead of building them from scratch? I don't understand. You just like smolt some steel and like harvest some rubber and like make tires and like, boom, you've got a car. I don't understand why you don't do it. It's the same thing. Like it is complicated and there is no good solution to solve that complication today. Just real quick. Do you, so having, this is, this is topical because we often get into the idea on the podcast about what would it take for uh, an enterprise to bring that cloud experience on prem, and I think I think that's a very good observation that to get that cloud experience on prem, you really need to be able to bring that that edge, you know, down 
with you, right? And the the skill to do that and the silicon to do that is actually quite difficult to come by. Yeah, absolutely. And I I, I think that NSX NSX is not that interesting to me, but they solve a problem. And the problem is, uh, don't make me call the network team. Uh, and that problem, I have this like idea that you know whatever pro- like. When you have a new piece of technology, it introduces some heartburn. The problem you're solving has to be like 3x greater than the heartburn that you're introducing. Nobody's going to go and be like, Linux is the easiest thing I've ever used. It's amazing. The, all of the pain that Linux gives you just pales in comparison to the value it brings. I think that about something like NSX as well. And so, Tim, to take your, your point, there has not been a solution that is enterprise-friendly that is flexible for that, right? And I think, you know, we come back to kind of the topic of the, of the, you know, the podcast today, which is like compute and automation and things like that. And I think one of the things that compute has done is they've separated themselves out from a physical topology. And I don't mean that to be like network virtualization. What I mean is that as soon as I care where things physically exist, I've just exponentially made everything more complicated. But if I can just say like, give me three M's and put them together, I don't give it, I don't care where the where the VMs live, right? I just assume that there are three of them and I assume that they're connected together. EVPN started down that route, right? To give me that same kind of anywhere connected, anywhere experience. But at the end of the day, I'm configuring a switch port. I have now put a physical constraint on everything I do, and it's like running with a drag chute. I will never catch up if that's my environment. Yeah, it's funny. I, I like how you said that uh, NSX solves a problem to have them say, I, don't make me call the network team, which works out because we don't want people to call us anyway. Um, but the uh, back, back to the uh, previous thing that we were talking about with the... Um, kind of the innovation of DPUs. It got me thinking about this. So, you know, the talk bit today, a topic today we wanted to talk about was innovation in the compute space versus the networking space and why networking seems to be a little bit slower. Um, just then we kind of talked about this idea of uh, enhancing the, the uh, innovation space in networking, but it's by using compute. So is the, is the innovation of networking always going to be tied to the progression of the compute space, or do we think that there is an opportunity to, to, you know, advance outside of that, but you have to be really thinking outside of the box. Yeah. Yes. You have to be thinking outside of the box. And I think that we as network engineers have done a massive disservice to our own industry. Um, And, and so I think first, you know, that's my, that's my little teaser um, before story time. Um, if we look back a handful of years ago, in the 6500, you know, we talked about at the beginning of the podcast, my favorite example. This thing had 128, 256 ports of really critical one gig core connectivity, right? If I lose that 6500, um, I'm going to have a bad day. That 6500 was driven by a 600, 650 megahertz. Power PC, single core, single threaded processor. iOS, classic iOS did not support multi-threading. And so people are like, I don't understand why networking is so like, why do we care about packet formats? And like, why is everything so rigid? And like, why are there all these sharp corners? And the reality is like, up until like just a couple of years ago, we were building the backbones of entire enterprise networks on like a TI-83 calculator. So we come from this world of trash compute. And the reason why is that because what we had to do was hard and domain specific. And so we're like, we're gonna sacrifice the CPU in sake of the ASIC, which is gonna generate a bunch of heat and cost a bunch of money. And we did Mm -hmm. that and we built these great networks. And then there was this shift probably around like the, early 2000s, 2005, 2010, I don't know exactly, I'm not a hardware guy, uh, where we changed everything. And we no longer needed really crusty old iOS software that didn't understand the concept of multi-threading. But we were also able to put real processors 
next to networking ASICs. And the problem that we had as network engineers is we did not evolve with that hardware, or at least we did not evolve at the speed of that hardware. While compute people got virtualization, they evolved at the speed of virtualization. They went from 20 computers to 4,000 computers, and they were forced to adopt automation and distributed monitoring and distributed administration. Our, although that speed increased for us, our overall footprint did not increase that much. Maybe we went from a cap 4K as an aggregation switch to 10 top of rack switches. Eh, I can live with that. I can still do that by hand. This comes back to like the amount of pain versus like the value, like there's not a 2X value gain to learn automation for 10 switches. And so now, like now all of a sudden, like where you had linear progression for both compute and network, compute breaks away. And compute now has this massive coefficient to grow twice, three times, five times as fast as networking. And now what's happened is networking's left holding the back. And here we are where half of our organizations have gone to cloud because they're like, infrastructure sucks, it's too slow and I hate it. And the other half are like, we cannot go to cloud because of regulatory, because of compliance, because of cost, because of whatever, and I hate you. And we struggle with that so much. And I think that history is really important because it's not just the hardware and the software, but it's also us culturally as network engineers have had to be very conservative because again, if I have that one massive chassis and I bring it down, I'm effed. And even yeah. as we've evolved into leaf and spine fabrics, it's really hard to get into the mindset of like, if I crash a spine, nobody cares because the reality is nobody cares. That's the whole idea of the architecture, but we're still thinking in a chassis based mentality and we just haven't moved fast enough. I think a lot of the network engineers though have been, you know, for better or worse trained to be extremely conservative because of the, where the, the, the place that the network holds within the, you know, there's a couple things, right? For one, it's like, in, it's, it's the classic problem of network as infrastructure, which might actually have something to do with our lack of innovation there as well, because it's like you turn on the water and you expect it to work, right? Like you don't care that the pipes you laid are 400 years old and, you know, terracotta running, you know, just like just old shit that has never been in, able to be replaced. Because, you know, it's there and it works and we have other shit going on in the business that is more important. Um, so I wonder if there's a little form following function there. I, I think there is, but I think this comes back to that disservice where I 100% agree with you, but it behooves us to look at the compute world where you can take that exact same argument 15 years ago and be like, I expect the people to rack and stack it and give me an ILO and then I have a computer. Like, I don't understand why this is hard. And then you evolve that to the next stage where it's like, I don't understand why you can't just give me a VM. Like, this isn't hard, right? Why is networking still hard? And in my, you know, my whole kind of hypothesis around this is it is a combination of we are too worried. And it's not just us, it's management. Like, it's a whole chain. It's no individual. It's like if you have managers who allow you to blow stuff up, then ICs are willing to take risks and figure things out. So I'm not blaming any individual contributors in an organization. But the other part of this is I would ask any listener here to think about how they plan their change windows. And I unfortunately have a talk from eight years ago describing the network change window, which is open notepad, type commands, email TXT file to team, have no one read it before your weekend change, and then cross your fingers and hope for the best as you copy and paste it in. That, like, I, I, had, yeah, I thought that was there. funny. <laughs> I thought that was funny seven years ago when we're kind of still doing the same thing. Ops sucks, but it's not ops fault. Why are we doing that? Because how do you test that change otherwise? Do you build a million dollar hardware lab? Do you use Container Lab and get yeah. like 70% functionality? And you're like, like uh, I really hope that 30% I'm missing isn't really important. <laughs> right? Like, we don't like have the CML same CML or whatever, like some. Right. Like CML, it, uh, GNS3, CML or whatever. Yeah. Container Lab, whatever. And again, compare and contrast to compute folks. What do compute folks do? They click three buttons and they get a, bu a whole cluster of VMs that they can deploy Kubernetes on and then test their change. 
to the point where that whole process becomes part of continuous testing where like before on Monday, I proposed my change in GitHub. Like I'm going to change my infrastructure as code, my YAML file for Ansible, whatever. It automatically stands up three VMs in AWS. It automatically deploys Kubernetes to it. It automatically tests to make sure that that's working. It automatically deploys my change. It tests to make sure my change didn't break. And then a senior engineer looks at it to make sure that I'm not like trying to change things like the day before Christmas. And what do we do in networking? Thoughts and prayers. That's the answer. True. Thoughts and prayers. Yeah. It's all it's all tied to hardware though, right? Networking ultimately in a way it that compute uh, but it has been able to break to away. Be, but it doesn't have to be. And this is I'm going to end up being a little bit of a shill for my former employer here, but that is a false narrative that drives me insane because at Cumulus, we're like, it's just a Linux box. And Cumulus's magic was take Linux kernel, shove it into the hardware. Like it's like the SpongeBob meme, like just take it from over here and shove it to over there. And as soon as your software is the source of truth for your hardware and that your software must have a software model, Cumulus invented the VRF for, Cum for Linux. So it didn't exist. Got to have a VRF on a, a network device. So we went to Linux and we invented it. As soon as your software is the source of truth, the hardware doesn't matter. The hardware just becomes a jet engine. And what that means though, is that I can take a software only version, a VM, a container, a who cares what, and I can run that. and I have the exact same functionality. And tell me any vendors who are doing the same thing, zero. And that is the thing that drives me insane about our industry. There's nothing that prevents Cisco, Arista, Juniper, you name them. I don't work for Cumulus anymore. I don't care. I don't even know what they've done in the last couple of years, but there's nothing that stops any of these vendors except for technical debt. I'll give them that. It's a hard problem to solve, but that's why we can't do it. Why can't I make a full replica of my data center on yeah. my laptop? Compute can do it. Compute has dev, yeah. prod, staging, engineering. Every engineer gets their whole production pipeline deployment of compute resources to just break and play with. And I can't get a switch to make sure that I do switch port VLAN or switch port VLAN add, add VLAN, whatever. You're right. I mean, yeah. and that you're absolutely right. And that, that also gives us the, uh, that's how we end up getting the, uh, most of the changes that fail and, and we, you know, the bad looks from everybody about, oh, well, your change failed and, <laughs> You know, you broke something on the network. And yeah, where the fuck do we test this? <laughs> where do we Microsoft, test it? Microsoft did a, a research paper a couple of years ago. You can look it up. It's called CrystalNet. Um, and they found, I'm probably going to get the number wrong. Please forgive me. But it's 70% of their data center failures and errors and outages. Misconfigurations. Somebody, somebody messed it up. And CrystalNet was their attempt to build. They're like, you know what? To hell with the vendors. We're going to build our own simulators. And they're like, we're just going to simulate all the vendors that we have in our environment, whatever they were. Like, they don't talk specifics, but you can, you know, like one starts with a C and the other one starts with an A and probably one starts with a J and kind of figure it out from there. Um, yeah. And it was there, like, they're like, we're going to build our own thing and they can simulate and test because they realize through empirical evidence, we're doing a bad job. So not not to pour salt on the wound, but uh, <laughs> like so, for when you were at uh, Cumulus, right? Like what was, what about the customer side of that adoption? Uh, I know you were talking about how the vendors aren't doing anything, but what about also coming from the customer side? Like what were some of the sticking points to get them to realize that things need to change as well? Um, it's new and it's scary. You know, like it can basically become summed up to that, right? Like, and, and it's twofold, like, I try to be more of a realist and not a total hater. Like, look, you have 40 switches in the data center running this new vendor that you have to learn and you're not very familiar with Linux and that all sounds really annoying. And you have 70 other network devices that are Cisco. Like, I, I just don't care and I can't be bothered. I mean, there's a whole like, there's like the, you know, all, all stories end in an XKCD comic, but like there's an XKCD comic about automation, right? Like, look, if you spend a little bit of time, like, the amount of time you spend automating and managing that cumulus network will become 
basically zero compared to the existing infrastructure. I mean, who has time? Who has the energy? Like, like I just don't, I, I, I can't be bothered to learn the new thing when I'm barely treading water with my existing thing. And that's a organizational yeah. failures. That's management right. failures. Like it's on a lot of parts. I'm not just going to blame the people, but at the same time, I, I encountered a, a large number of people who were just unwilling to learn. Well, and also, you know, to, to bring it to uh, one of my favorite comparisons, like what kind of roles do the standards bodies play here? Right. Like in the networking industry, you have things like IETF, uh, but in compute, like the Linux Foundation, they're so night and day different. Um, and it's like, why? I don't I don't understand. Like, what is the holdup there? Why can't we be as innovative as the compute side? I don't know if you have but, thoughts on that. I'm going to go ahead and uh, stretch out for this one. Um, so I think that the IETF, the IEEE, their function is exceptionally important when two boxes talk to each other, right? If we cannot agree on a protocol, on a framing, on a packet format, we have closed fabrics. We have closed networks. We will never have a routing protocol. I can never connect a Cisco device to a Juniper device. Everything's terrible. However, when we're talking about management, I don't need my Cisco management to talk to my Juniper management. And the failure that we have had in the networking industry in IETF is taking that same assumption in which we need a universal manager, right? We want the Esperanto of network configuration. And do you know how many people in the earth speak Esperanto? It's about the same number of devices that can be universally configured via IETF standards. Roughly, we'll round up to zero. If you look at the Linux Foundation and the CNCF and what they've done is they've been like, let's find a problem space, encourage and cultivate solutions in that problem space. I'm going to take my own. This is my point of view on this is like the CNCF, for example, is like what sucks about managing Kubernetes infrastructure? Like that's their that's their hypo, like they just put it out there and then somebody comes up to them and they're like monitoring sucks. I'm like, cool, it does. Who are you? And they're like, we're Prometheus. I'm like, cool, welcome aboard. CNCF project. Right. Add to our landscape that has a Add million to the landscape. other projects. <laughs> and the thing is, is there's like a a capitalism element where they're like, we're not going to just have Prometheus. Like, that's not our decided standard. We're going to have like two or three. And it gives you a short list of who to look at. And then we'll let the industry decide who wins. And the IETF works completely the opposite. Right. The IETF oh, yeah. is like Soviet Russia where a bunch of bureaucrats sit together and decide on the best answer for you to run in your network. And, you know, this is the answer. Please don't ask. Like, no, no opinions, no questions. And so it's slow. It's clunky. Not the right answer. You know, we've had these things like NetConf. We've had Yang. We've had OpenConfig. There have been a couple of different things. And, like, look, they somebody's going to write you some hate mail and be like, Yang, that yeah, models are actually really great. Sure, whatever. The reality is that... <laughs> <laughs> right alex says no um the the reality is oh, that bring it there they, they can send it all they want <laughs> yeah thank you uh the reality is like i don't want to write xml so like what's my alternative and the alternative in the itf land is yeah just write xml like just suck it up buttercup conform to the standard conform to the standard and so if you look again what does compute do like let's peek over the fence and see how the other half lives and the other half just does whatever the hell they want do you want to do it in terraform do you want to do it with Plumi? Do you want to do it with Crossplane? There's a bunch of different ways, and the industry's figuring it out. At the end of the day, what has happened in compute land that has not happened in networking land is I have an API-first mentality to configure my system. And it doesn't mean I have APIs. It means the API configures a system. The First. COI is a client of the API. Not yes. there are two things that's like program the same state. Like if you run a command, if you run router BGP 65535, that is an API call. Where we have failed is that even the good APIs are bolted on. And we have yeah, failed right. at reevaluating that to be API first. Because as soon as I'm API first, I don't expect Chris to build a whole API library for Cisco. 
I don't expect Tim to build a whole API library for Juniper. I need somebody else to build that provider so I can plug into it. Why? It doesn't matter if you know what Terraformer is or not. You have heard of Terraform. And the reason you've heard of Terraform is because of exactly that. They have abstracted out the AWS API. They have abstracted out the Amazon right. or the Azure API and the Google API to make it simple so that you can write a little bit of code and get a whole bunch of value. And we absolutely cannot do that in networking. And there is no line of sight to being able to do that in networking. Nobody cares. Even the providers that exist in Terraform for the for the network, the traditional network devices that run in the Still cloud are on. pretty bolt are not yeah, not only bolt on, but just like so lacking, right? Yeah, right. Sorry, I just got interrupted by a child. Can you ask that question again, Tim? No, there was no question. I was just oh. pointing out that the traditional network vendors, Terraform providers are like Chris mentioned, bolted on and just not feature rid. Not you know, you can tell they were not built. API first, as you would expect, right? So, and that's exactly right. They're not yeah. API first, and I think again, there's two huge components, right? Component number one is exactly what you said; they're not API first. And component number two is there is a physical constraint, a physical topology constraint around them. If I want to spin up an EC2 instance, what I say, I, I can provide a bunch of like abstract identifiers. I don't really care where they live. Give me this EC. Give me this VM attach it to this ID of a network, which is attached to this ID of a firewall, which is attached to this ID of a NAT gateway. The thing is, is that when I'm using IDs, I don't care where they live. But if I want to go and use the Cisco Terraform provider, whoever, I have to type E00. I suddenly have to have a level of knowledge of the physical deployment that I super don't care about. And now all of a sudden I'm back into a place of like, well, this isn't even, not only is it not fun, it's actually more tedious than if I just locked into the box. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. Y your two solutions are give me a whole virtual copy, right? Give me the ability to simulate my entire data center or give me like make the host of the network edge and make the whole data center go away. Because if I just give a trunk up to my hypervisor and I make my DPU and EVP an endpoint, then who cares? Everything goes away. Mm -hmm. I no longer care about the topology, and and instead we're stuck in networking where we get neither. The issues that we're that we that we just talked about with like the standards bodies, like you know, for using the examples of IETF versus uh, you know IEEE versus the CNCF, do we feel like that ties to obviously culture ties into that a huge piece, right? Culture um, breeds the behavior, um, but do we think that it also relates to um, maybe a maturity and like a debt problem. Um, cause obviously the standards bodies on the network side have to kind of coexist with a lot of this ancient technology that we know is still prominent in the world today. Whereas CNCF, um, you, it's kind of a newer playground, right? You don't have to, you don't have to worry about the, the dangers. Um, like, you know, there's, no, there's not a lot of lead paint around everywhere, right? It's, it's, it, you kind of have this, um, safer environment to operate in, right? And I, I, you know, I think it's a really good question because if there's not a bunch of lead paint around, what are we as network engineers going to, going to munch on during a maintenance window? Um, <laughs> but, um, I, I think it's a valid question, but I, I disagree with it being the problem because if you look at CNCF again, they're taking a, I'm not saying CNCF is perfect, right? Like it, it has its challenges, but they're taking a here is it like they're taking a problem statement first approach and just letting different solutions solve that problem. The problem with IETF and I think open config, you know, as they would say in the South, uh, bless their heart, uh, that they tried to solve is they're like, what if we created a single abstraction for every vendor's configuration? And the thing is, is like you have two different problems there. Problem number one is that now open config runs behind the curve. Meaning if Cumulus comes up with BGP unnumbered, there's no open config model for that because Cisco doesn't support it. So I now all of a sudden can't use this feature that is cool and shiny because not everybody supports it even though it's dope and I want it. That's problem number one. Problem number two, I'm gonna go to you the GM of whatever at big vendor X. And I say, 
Chris, you own the business. You need to drive sales and revenue. We should put engineers on this thing that makes our config the exact same as any box so you can replace it at any time with any other vendor. Can I get four engineers to work on that? You were never going to agree to that. Never. Right. Never in a yeah. million years. <laughs> never. Like You have to be insane or Amazon has to be like, we're going to buy 10,000 switches unless you do this. Like Those are the only two options, right? I'm not going to do it because uh, some insurance agency in rural Iowa might buy because they thought open config was cool because of a, like a conference they went to, right? Like that's not how it's going to work. And so IETF's dependence on universal agreement has been its hindrance when it comes to network management. And I think that if you look at like, why is Ansible taken off? It's because I can just build a template. That template is not the best way to do these things, but it's the way that works for everybody. And Ansible has leaned into that and really like, they're the only tool out there that works with networking. One, because they're agentless, which is a whole nother soapbox. But, but two, because I don't, I don't need a bunch of Ansible libraries. I can build a template, render the template, and then push it. And so I can take my network engineer knowledge of what is unique and different and like the data structure of Juniper's BGP versus Arista's BGP. And like that takes me five minutes. I don't need six months of IETF discussion. I just build that, Fair. I pop yeah. in some variables, boom, automated. Well, on that note, Pete, uh, I don't want to cut this conversation too short. We definitely need to have a part two. Um, I think I think we're running out of time. There's just so much more to talk about, so many additional uh, questions that, that I think we all have. Um, so we for sure need, uh, we'll, we'll have a, a part two on this. Uh, as, Alex, as long you as you're willing be, to come back. <laughs> you might be surprised, but I have some opinions in this space. So I would yeah, yeah, just I look few, forward right? to number two. <laughs> we'll, we'll, yeah, we'll do it soon. That's, all right. that's been great. Awesome. All right. Uh, well, thank you all very much for tuning into the Cables to Clouds podcast. Uh, if you like this episode, please share it around to anyone you think might be interested. Give us that five-star rating on your favorite podcatcher. And, of course, hit those like and subscribe buttons on our YouTube channel. Until next time. Hi, everyone. It's Alex. And this has been the Cables to Clouds podcast. Thanks for tuning in today. If you enjoyed our show, please subscribe to us in your favorite podcatcher, as well as subscribe and turn on notifications for our YouTube channel to be notified of all of our new episodes. Follow us on socials at Cables to Clouds. You can also visit our website for all of the show notes at CablesToClouds.com. Thanks again for listening and see you next time.